I just loved it. I love that there is laboratory medicine with it. So there's the pathology side of me, but there's the clinical side too, where I actually get to interact with patients. I get to see patients. I get to talk with patients. Dr. Aaron Schmuckler, how you doing, my friend? What's up? It's good to see you all. <laughs> Hanging Great. out here. in West Virginia. How's, uh, how's West Virginia these days with COVID? I learned the other day that we apparently have the second uh, largest transmission rate in the United States, um, but this is uh, through NPR. I don't know, but uh, it, it is. We're hanging in there. That's what we yeah. got. You, you guys do have the second highest. Uh, R- RT.live confirms that. Maine is number one. West Virginia, number two. Uh, so you confirming i suppose that's all right it's it's really not that high like all the numbers are really close together um and so just uh just a couple more people wearing their mask and we'll be all right we'll get you down um thank you for taking some time to join me tonight taking some time out of your your busy evening to talk about pathology but more specifically blood bank medicine and uh, when, I, when I was thinking about blood bank medicine, I'm like, I wonder what kind of cases potentially we could do. But I'm sure there's something uh, because blood bank medicine is, is one of those really fringe specialties that nobody probably knows about and that uh, I want to give more exposure to. So let's talk about blood bank medicine. Uh, the biggest myth that I know is that you have to be a vampire to go into blood bank medicine. Is that true? Partially. <laughs> how does one how does one learn about blood bank medicine and come to want to be a blood bank medicine specialist oh gosh um truthfully i didn't really get exposed to what real blood bank medicine is like until residency mm-hmm. um and I had a little taste of it when I was a resident at St. Joseph's Hospital at the Barrow Institute in Phoenix, where I had initially started my training. Um, but then, and I got a little taste of it because we were doing something called audits. We were auditing, which sounds kind of boring, but basically we were looking to see, well, is blood really necessary for this patient or not? Because a lot of what we want to do is make sure that that when someone receives blood, obviously not only is it safe for them, but is it also indicated for them, you know? And so uh, we did all these audits, but then I transitioned over to the Ohio State University for my uh, continuation of residency. And that's my very first rotation there was actually in blood banking. And there I got to see patients every day. I treated them with a procedure called apheresis, which we'll go into. Uh, I have a case, a couple cases for that. Um, and um, I don't know, I just I I just loved it. I love that there is laboratory medicine with it. So there's the pathology side of me, but there's the clinical side too, where I actually get to interact with patients. I get to see patients. I get to talk with patients, mostly during this procedure um, called apheresis. It just takes uh, an hour or two hours, depending on what kind. Um, And then that's it. It's gratifying. I I help help patients. It's like almost instant gratification sometimes. Sometimes it takes a little longer for it to kick in if it works, but yeah. it's really fun. And, uh, yeah. So what are some of the biggest myths or misconceptions that you see from, from residents, from medical students that you're constantly fighting? Um, Ooh, uh, myths or, Hmm. I, you know, I think we're just so not as well known until <laughs> once you actually know blood banking and get to know it, uh, yeah. then maybe, but even still, um, I can tell you truthfully that most of the calls that people do have to deal with in pathology are blood banking. Um, So there's a lot to deal with that aspect of it. But from a myth standpoint, uh, not much from residents. Um, I suppose the myths really would come from maybe patients, actually. Um, There's still always this preconception and notion that maybe our blood is not safe. Maybe we're always worried about transfusion transmitted infections. and uh, in a way, it's a myth because it's super, super, super rare to be getting any kind of infection like HIV or hepatitis or anything like that. More likely, you might just get an allergic type of reaction or a fever as a yeah. side effect. So um, 
that's maybe the major myth that I might potentially run into. Um, yeah. So, uh, let me the, let me ask yeah. you something that's been in the news lately. And and if we don't, if you don't want to talk about it, we'll, we'll diverge to another topic. But in the news lately, the uh, and I don't know if it's the CDC or the FDA who came to this conclusion, but they changed the rules just a little bit for mm. um, gay men to to donate blood here in the U.S. Europe, um, I don't know if they completely removed the restriction or they, they, they lessened it a, a lot more. Uh, what are your thoughts on why we still have a restriction for them, for, for gay men? Well, first of all, um, about damn time it's reduced. <laughs> um, look, I'll explain to it this way. And this, it's... Um, and I have to explain to it because this is a scientific approach. Um, and we are people who have to reason through science to explain our findings and what, what we do. And so the reasons we have it are the, that I, that I see it as are this. Basically, when we talk about like these transfusion transmitted infections that we all think about, we test every single blood product for these infections. All these tests have different sensitivities, different levels of detection. And we also want to know, are we testing the antigen or are we testing the antibody or are we doing both? And so when we're testing antigen coming from an HIV molecule, it comes pretty quickly. Usually we can detect it as early as like seven to nine days for the major viruses. If we're looking at antibodies, it could take a while to develop those antibodies. And so there's this balance of being able to detect what we're seeing and not detect what we're seeing and what we're missing that we try to optimize when we're testing our blood products. Often it gets confounded with something called a false positive. Um, and that just happens for a variety of reasons. Uh, so the scientific explanation I'm trying to justify it is that it takes a while sometimes and maybe not as long to identify something. So when it comes to specifically something like this issue, um, Unfortunately, we know there's been a history of HIV amongst this population. Um, and so it's a matter of by the time we detect it, by the time ideally we detect it uh, at a reasonable, uh, approachable, sensible rate. And so um, I think the science is good enough that we can reduce our window period for all of this stuff in terms of this balance of detection and not detection, at least how I see it. But there's still always this risk that I feel like over time, we'll just need to improve upon and try to do a better job of recognizing. And I, it's probably how I'll just leave it at that. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Cause when you look kind of big picture, I think the heterosexual population transmits HIV much more than the homosexual population. And so it's just this weird stigma that's still holding on there in the, in the blood bank world. So, uh, thank, thanks for your thoughts on that. It's, it's an interesting one. Um, I hate stigmas a lot and we try to reduce them as much as we can and yeah. maybe we're slow to change, but eventually we'll continue to do, just do better. So, yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, the, I think my hope is that it's less about the stigma and fear around homosexuality and just making sure that we're doing right by the patients who are receiving blood. And if, if the, the question is, um, are we, uh, are, are we doing right by them? Are we reducing our donor supply so much so that we're hurting our patients and, and, and do we, do we have to open up this Avenue or I don't know, I don't know the right answer, but it's, it's a weird, it's a weird thing out there. There's another thing you bring up actually, um, that's somewhat related, that's somewhat, uh, affecting a certain population of individuals. And that's, um, uh, women of childbearing age. And I only bring this up because actually science has shown that we've been able to reduce incidence of something called trolley or an acute uh, transfusion related acute lung injury. A lot of these, uh, a lot of trolley procedures are due to a lot of uh, antibodies and stuff that uh, pregnant, pregnant women or women who have been pregnant have been exposed to in a fetus. And so they develop these antibodies and all that stuff that can eventually cause neutrophils to go haywire and cause acute respiratory distress syndrome. What we've shown is that by limiting that particular population, by limiting is we specifically test for those particular antibodies, 
And actually, if you're negative, we'll still use your plasma. But if it's positive, we may reserve your plasma for a different purpose so that you're still helping somebody. Mm -hmm. And by doing that limitation, we've actually been able to show a reduced incidence of trolley amongst as a major uh, transfusion reaction that we have to deal with. So in some ways, that's been kind of a good thing that we've shown. But I mean, yeah. there's this balance of biology, but there's this balance of just non-biological factors that we have accustomed to that are somewhat social constructs or something that we have brought on amongst ourselves as a human civilization. And I think it's finding a right balance between the scientific evidence and the non-scientific evidence to do what's best for, as you say, our patients and doing them no harm at yeah. all. Yeah, got it. Uh, what does a, a day in the life look like for you? Um, day in the life. Okay. So, um, I sometimes don't know whether, whether to let's start with when I go to work because sometimes I get woken up at night and I'm not on call and they'll still call me because I just happen to have this little niche where it's like, well, I got to help somebody out at two in the morning because it's a really complex case. It requires a specialist. All right. So, um, but I'll go into work. Um, I always will check in with my blood bank. Uh, I want to see if there are any problems, any issues. Um, make sure we have our inventory okay. Uh, that fluctuates a lot. Um, I will, uh, I will uh, probably take care of just some catch up work from previous day, catch up on emails. But um, a lot of the real work involves me teaching residents. I uh, we have to educate the next generation of people who are going to be competent in blood banking so that they can practice independently, or if not, at least know how to ask for help when they need it, right? So I don't expect anyone to be specializing in my field. I just don't. I just want them to be able to know enough to get by and to be able to know when to ask for help when they need it. So um, I educate residents, um, do a lot of teaching, um, and then um, I will have meetings with my colleagues. Uh, we talk about whole blood, for example. Uh, that we're bringing into our institution. I'll also talk about um, incidents that may have happened to patients due to uh, an issue in the system. And I'll say a system because sometimes it's our fault, sometimes it's a nurse's fault, sometimes it's another doctor's fault. We talk about those issues so that we resolve them and make sure that patients are safer as a result of these issues that come up. Um, there's administrative things that I have to take care of. Uh, quality things I have to look over. Um, and uh, I'll sign out uh, reports of our stem cells that we process because I'm in charge of a stem cell laboratory. Um, and since we last talked, I, uh, for better or worse, was decided to be named the director of coagulation. So now I have another lab under me that I'll have to look over, but it's fun. I enjoy Wait, it. I wouldn't you rather <laughs> be the director of anti-coagulation? <laughs> <laughs> um, in normal setting, yes, but not so much that we bleed to death, even though all bleeding eventually stops, you know, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so teaching a lot of meetings, but a lot of things to help improve our system and make us a better uh, overall working team for our patients. I always yeah. keep that in mind. Patient, patient, patient. It takes a village. Yeah. Talk about the training path to become a, a blood bank specialist. Sure. So um, a blood bank specialist, uh, what I did was I uh, did my medical school training. I am an MD by training, um, but DOs, no differently treated in my opinion, or at least shouldn't be. Um, they become blood bankers just as much. Um, and so ideally you go through medical school uh, and after medical school, you do residency. Um, you could do residency in anesthesiology or hematology, oncology or pathology uh, to become a blood banker. Blood banking itself is usually a one year or two year uh, subspecialty fellowship. Um, it's under the auspices of pathology uh, they administer the board to become a board certified transfusion specialist. Uh, but um, you can become a spe transfusion specialist as an internist, anesthesiologist, um, ED physician even. Express interest in it, basically, I think is really the key. And you have to get good with laboratory medicine uh, to become one. But uh, there's a lot of clinical sides too, which is why we uh, appreciate uh, outside of pathology thinking for this kind of specialty. Talk about that, that clinical side of it. A couple of students have asked, what is, what does that clinical side look like? The interactions with patients? 
Um, you have to be good with taking a focused transfusion history. Um, a lot of the people you may be interacting with are patients who may have uh, sickle cell disease. Um, so, uh, and the reason is because some of the treatments you give uh, to them is an apheresis procedure treatment or red cell exchange. Um, and um, you have to be good with getting that kind of a history. You have to also be good with, um, let's say manners really, uh, you're at the bedside with them and you have to talk with families too, especially if those patients aren't able to speak. Some of them may be intubated and you're treating them because you're doing a really, really heroic life-saving measure that could be third or fourth down the line, depending on how sick they are and you're throwing the works. And sometimes what we do is hopefully going to help them and maybe it isn't and they may sadly pass away as a result of it. Um, and so you have to deal with a lot of different clinical conditions spanning neurology, uh, hematology, uh, uh, like both benign and malignant hematology, a whole slew of different conditions actually. So that clinical history in terms of figuring out what the patient condition is and seeing if your particular therapy, be it a transfusion or an apheresis treatment helps is kind of where our focus is. And uh, interacting with your colleagues too, your clinicians who are on the front lines taking care of the patient because you're helping them out as much as you're helping yourself out by talking to them. So yeah. How much for, for blood bank medicine, how much does your pathology training play into what you're doing day in and day out? Um, I like to think of it as 50, 50, um, and 50% 50 in the sense that it's 50% lab medicine, I guess. Um, maybe right now a little more so since I'm not doing as much apheresis as I had done in my training, just by nature of the job that I'm at. Um, but a good portion of it is path. There's a lot of laboratory controls, quality controls, uh, a lot of ensuring that the results that are being reported are accurate and reflective of what should be accurate for the patient. Um, it's a lot of pathology, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and the regulations. Oh, my gosh, the regulations. <laughs> blood, is a pr blood is a drug. I mean, it is a drug. It's regulated by the FDA. And so we have to abide by a whole slew of FDA regulations just to make sure that one red cell unit is safe and going to be okay for your patient. <laughs> So yeah. it's, it's, it's very challenging on that side, actually. Uh, I, I want to talk about blood in, in a second, but uh, a, a question about residency length. What's the residency timeline, fellowship timeline look like? So um, pathology residency is four years uh, and the year or two after that, a fellowship for transfusion medicine. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. What is the, what is the, the path from, I'm at the blood mobile on campus getting stuck. They're, they're, they're draining my blood to it's in a blood bank ready to go. Um, so um, you're going to be Bob Belcher and donate blood and hopefully not faint. For any of you who haven't seen that Halloween episode, it was gold for blood bankers. Gold this year. I love it. Um, so you go donate blood, right? And when you go donate I, I blood, you're every, every week on, on UF's campus, every eight weeks, I was, I was in the blood mobile donating camp, uh, do, donating blood. Thank you. <laughs> I can't appreciate it enough. Thank I, I you. Lots, I have lots of scars on my anti-cube from, from all those needles. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. We really, we, we, I can't stop and thank you enough for donating blood. It's a huge service for all of us. So you donate blood, you donate whole blood, right? And then all that blood gets quarantined off the bat. And the reason it gets quarantined is because we got to make sure that it passes all of our testing, uh, infectious disease testing. We do a number of infectious disease testing. A lot of testing we do is screened actually, where we don't do lab testing, but we screen you from donating in the first place, but you pass that, you donate blood. In about maybe, let's say, three days time or so, the testing all comes back negative. Then we release it to how we release it to the general inventory, so to speak. Our blood products have different lifespans. And so some are as short as five days, maybe even shorter. Uh, some are as long as maybe 42 days, or we store it for a year. It just depends on the product and how it's stored. So when you say product, I, I think a lot of people are, are potentially confused because okay. we say donate blood and, and we picture 
blood and that's whole blood. So talk about the different products that you can take from a blood donation. Sure. So yes, whole blood. Um, when you take whole blood, there's a bunch of components in whole blood, actually. Uh, you've got plasma, you've got red cells, um, you've got something called granulocytes, which are white blood cells that we sometimes will do. Um, we have platelets, we have cryoprecipitate. All of these are different elements in our blood. Uh, the red cells help with oxygenation. And so you give it to somebody that helps carry oxygen so someone's able to breathe um, and just help oxygen delivery. You have plasma and cryoprecipitate, which have a lot of coagulation factors that help you clot. Platelets also will help you clot. So we have that as well. And uh, when you donate whole blood, it gets separated into these little components that I just mentioned. And we use these components to do what is called blood component therapy. And that all that basically means is if your patient is in need of platelets because their platelet count is low, just give them platelets. We don't need to give them usually whole blood. Their red cell or if hemoglobin is low, just give them red cells. That's all that they need. And we discovered this back in the 1940s, like, oh, wait, we don't got to give whole blood to everybody. We can break it down into components. So let's just do component therapy so we don't give people excess stuff and we give people the stuff that you just do need, basically. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. I want to jump into some of the cases that you have prepared. Uh, students love the cases. So let's go and jump into those. Um, how do you have them prepared? Um, PowerPoint? Yeah, perfect. You can share your screen. While you're doing that, talk about COVID and, and blood bank medicine. How has COVID affected the, the supply of blood, if, if at all? So um, it did a little bit, actually. Um, we were in a bit of a shortage. And the reason we were in a bit of a shortage was because um, a lot of our resources of where we get blood, which is your local blood drive at the school or in your office setting, they all kind of got shut down because they all closed down and all did social distancing. And so as a result of that, our blood supply actually dwindled a little bit. Somewhat paradoxically, though, I think we've had, in a way, not as bad of a I mean, it's sort of stabilized in a way, in part because we didn't have the elective surgeries and we don't usually use as much blood in our elective surgeries uh, because they're elective. We don't expect to be losing blood. Otherwise, it's such a huge procedure. Uh, we wouldn't be like, I mean, we don't really need blood for something as elective as like a, a gallbladder or um, something like, uh, I don't know. Uh, I mentioned about blood components earlier. Something that's kind of making a cut now uh, is something called whole blood. Uh, which we used in the military. And um, it's making a comeback now in the civilian world, which I got to say is pretty fascinating because um, I didn't think we would be using military medicine in a civilian setting like this, but we are. And we're using it a lot for something called hemorrhagic shock, where patients lose a lot, a lot, a lot of blood for a variety of reasons. And we will give them that whole blood that you donate, instead of breaking it into components, will take the whole thing and use that and transfuse it to patients to help them and find that it actually helps them a lot. So it's like we've come back full circle the use of whole blood uh, in, uh, in in our in our world, basically. So we're going to go through the. So we've got three cases here. Um, first case. Next slide. Don't worry, you'll see that image again. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna present this case of a 52-year-old male. He presents with a history of an acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and he's getting chemotherapy. Part of his chemotherapy includes this medication called PEG aspergates, okay? And I'll get to that in a little bit. So when he presents, he presents with right upper quadrant pain. He's got this rebound tenderness and guard, guarding. He's in agony. Poor guy. He's got some diarrhea. He's also got something called this positive uh, Murphy sign. And so um, positive Murphy sign basically is, is that you take this deep breath and the examiner is going to press down right underneath your rib cage on the right side here. And if you experience some pain on inspiration, that's not really a good sign. It kind of suggests that maybe there's something going on with your gallbladder, possibly. So um, go to the next slide here. 
I think my my only uh, oh, yeah. my my only issue with with going into medicine when I did was that I, all the like cool tests and and uh, like procedures and instruments they're all named already, and I, nothing gets named after me, so I, I'm kind of mad about that. Whoever this we Murphy just, guy is, <laughs> <laughs> we just had this thing on Twitter actually where we were talking about certain uh, cells, and we were thinking about uh, calling a particular cell the Funky cell after uh, Funky from the rest of development. Um, so mm -hmm. I'll have to revisit that conversation again. But mm -hmm. you're right; everything's almost already named. They're named. We just have to be extra, extra special and inquisitive to try to find something new. Uh, we do have Justin on live with us if we want to ask him some questions as we go. Sure. Hi, Justin. Um, hi. hi. Where? How are you this evening? I'm good. How are you guys doing? Very well. If, if you don't mind me asking, where are you calling in from? I'm calling from Oregon. I'm in a little place in the middle of nowhere, so I'm um, sorry if my service is not that good. <laughs> So far, so uh, good. Yeah, good. Probably better than mine at this rate. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All yeah. right. So I give you some uh, LFT, some liver function studies here, and I uh, give you some lipid studies here as well. Um, so as you can see here in the lift column here, we get some liver function tests. So the ALT and the ALC are some liver function studies that uh, give you what their value is in this patient. And it looks like there's an upper limit of normal just to give you a reference range of what we're talking about. So the ALT and ALC are a little bit high. We have amylase here uh, that's also a little bit high and the lipase also a little bit high. And then on the right side, I give you a lipid panel, and the lipid panel shows a triglyceride of a whopping 3,000 milligrams <laughs> per liter when the upper limit happens to be 150. Total cholesterol is 518, and his HDL is a little bit on the lower side. Hmm. This is interesting. You're asking me, oh, well, I guess there's no question yet. <laughs> I guess the thing is, what's kind of going through your mind here? We can go back to the previous slide just to kind of show what the major uh, points here are, is that you have this guy in chemotherapy getting pig aspergase, he's got a leukemia, and that's his presentation. He's acting as if he's got something going on and is maybe, I don't know, what do you think the problem is? Um, so you said that there was a problem with his... Um, did you say pancreas or with his, um, if he had a pain after the Murphy's test? Um, yeah. So do you think, would there be, um, if the triglycerides are up and, um, I'm a sophomore in pre-med, but I'm going to try to, you know, let's see. Um, is there any like stones or anything that would be forming, even though that's more on, you know, crystal salt slide, not, not on, you know, triglyceride. Yeah. Stones are always possible in this case. Sure. Good thought. I didn't mm -hmm. mention it, I think in here, but I think they did a liver uh, uh, ultrasound. And I don't think they found any, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. Nothing in particular about that. Okay. And, hmm. And you said he said he had leukemia, you said? Yep. Oh, interesting. So then um, the gallbladder does digest this stuff. Um, is there anything um, bad happening to the gallbladder in, in and of itself? I don't know. <laughs> it's a great thought. Um, not quite in this case, the gallbladder, but it definitely is around the area. It is involving the hepatobiliary system, we'll say. Mm. Hmm. Are things getting sludgy? A little, a little bit. Uh, maybe a little bit. Um, is it... Um, okay, I'm just going to say it's cirrhosis or something like that. Or, well, well, maybe that's, that's alcohol. Hmm. Um, uh, I'm trying to think a little bit also from like my, um, my dad. He has high... I think he, he also has uh, high triglycerides and... Um, he got a lab done. Um, he eats a lot of um, what's called things with um, oils and a really high um, salt diet too. Don't know if that um, has any correlation. I mean, there's 
this is different. I know, but yeah, I actually don't know. <laughs> that's okay. Um, no, that's why it's a special case report here. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go to the next slide. Here we go. Let's have some fun here. So we're on the right track. We're actually thinking possibly some sort of pancreatic dysfunction or maybe an acute pancreatitis with this case. So what we did for this guy, actually, and I'll explain why we think this in a bit. We, were, we went ahead and did what was called a therapeutic plasma exchange, uh, where we exchanged one blood volume. We used a replacement fluid of 5% albumin. I'll go into this. Don't worry. And when we did this particular procedure, this therapeutic exchange, the triglycerides you will see dropped from a good 3,000 now to about 1,139. Cholesterol normalized and his HDL also went much farther down, but we got rid of a bunch of cholesterols and lipids, et cetera, okay? So let's go to the next slide. And this is what apheresis is. Um, it's basically an oil change. So let's walk this through. Uh, you'll see whole blood entering this really large centrifuge. So think of apheresis as an apheresis machine. It's a big centrifuge. And remember, when we take a centrifuge to blood, we're going to separate it out into components like I described earlier, the same kind of components that you're collecting for people to transfuse, like red cells or plasma or whatever. So we take this large centrifuge, separate it out, and what we are doing in this case is we are taking that patient's plasma and getting rid of it, basically. And instead, the oil that we're giving to this patient is albumin. And we're able to do that because most of your plasma, at least protein, is basically about 50% or so, 55% albumin. So all we're doing is replacing one thing for another. And the only thing we're not doing is giving uh, coagulation factors. But for a single treatment, it's okay. They'll be okay. Coag factors usually resolve back in about uh, 24 hours or so. Um, so he'll get his coag factors back and not have much of a bleeding complication. So when we did that, take a look at what happened in the next slide. But before we jump in, I, I, I sure. want to know, uh, just to help uh, help students understand, the, the word apheresis, right? I think a lot of people <laughs> will know A typically is without. Where, where does that word come from? What's the, the It is it? origin in Greek. The Greek apheresis to take away from. Mm, interesting. Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, moving on. All right. So the above, if you didn't know any better, kind of looks like a tub of lard or a tub of margarine. <laughs> yes, right? Look how opaque that thing is. My golly, that is exactly what we took out of his blood. This is what his triglycerides are right there. <laughs> sludgy <laughs> it is so sludgy oh yeah. my god um and then on the bottom there is what should be normal plasma so if i were to take a sample of your plasma it should look that straw colored on the bottom there so um we kind of fixed him after this procedure at least temporarily so um that's why we did it and the reason we did it actually is, uh, yeah, we'll hold on to that slide for a sec. It's just absolutely mind boggling how like the top is what was in this guy's blood and causing him this acute pain. Mm. And in the bottom is after just one treatment, we just did this one procedure. And what we did was we just basically took a lot, all, we took the equivalent of all his plasma and replaced it entirely with albumin. So um, that is what, uh, what happened afterwards. What is the the cause of this, right? So you do this apheresis, and it seems like that's just a band aid, uh, and that yep. in in wh at whatever amount of time, it's just going to go back to the top picture again. It potentially can, and in this case, it happens to be related to his chemotherapy. Mm. If you go to the next slide, I'll explain a little bit as to why. So. Leukemic cells require something called L-asparagine. It's an amino acid that we actually all use. And the leukemia cells use it for survival. And so one of the ways we treat leukemia is something called asparaginase. It is an enzyme. And so it breaks down the asparagine. Uh, it prevents cell growth and induces cell death so that leukemic cells basically die. Peg asparagase is the same kind of idea as L-asparaginase. It's just pegylated, meaning it has an extra 
carbohydrate backbone that basically prolongs its life. So the enzyme sticks around longer. Think of it as Super Pac-Man having just had his, I think it's the cherries or whatever, and is just unstoppable, right? But the problem, unfortunately, that we sometimes see with this is that it can cause an increase in triglycerides. And we think it happens to be due to uh, an alteration in the flipping metabolism, in this case, for the worse. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't always happen. I only saw one case of it, and it was an illustrated case report we decided to, to show in this. Uh, we decided to write up. Uh, I did this uh, with a resident when I was a fellow. But... Uh, um, I just thought this was kind of neat because it showed that uh, this patient had something where we pretty much had an idea of what it was based on his history. We treated him and we got better. And it was really just because of that clinical history of this guy being on chemotherapy for his procedures or for his uh, leukemia and uh, an unknown, unfortunate, not common side effect. Recognize it, treat it. He's done. I mean, they may need to adjust his peg aspartase uh, levels in the future or do something like that. But uh, yeah. my job was done. It was gratifying. It was nice to see him get better <laughs> after that one treatment. So, so what you basically did was was you put the fear of God in every student watching this right now because oh my gosh, you do need to know what you learned in undergrad with amino acids to be a good blood bank doctor. So. All of the MCAT trauma, all of the biochem, organic chemistry, learn, learning how to draw your amino acids and know the three-letter abbreviation, one-letter abbreviation, you need to know it. <laughs> so I have a confession to make because in the next cases, I'm going to be doing some actual teaching with this. So bear with me. I have my whiteboard. You kind of do. And I'm not going to lie. I actually did like organic chemistry, but I will tell you there are blood bankers out there that I am sure absolutely hated it. No. So don't worry. Don't worry. But- it's nice when you have organic and can understand it because it does play a role in what we're doing. So, especially in blood banking. <laughs> yeah. um, a, a good a good question that came up with with that last case is the significance of replacing plasma with albumin. Why replace it with anything? Why not just take out the plasma and let the body re recover on its own eventually? Well, that's a great question. Um, uh, well, you can't really replace a car's oil without anything, right? If you take the car's oil away from the car, the car is just going to overheat and it's not going to work at all. This is kind of a similar situation. You kind of have to replace the plasma with something so that there is protein balance and something to prevent the body from swelling like a blimp. Let's go into what this product is albumin it's albumin it's the major protein in your body it holds oncotic pressure so that your fluid balance is maintained in basic homeostasis if you don't so have any osmosis and diffusion too no come on <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of diffusion kinetics actually having to do with uh, apheresis. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it has a lot to do with that. So, but uh, be thankful that we can give just albumin. It's entirely sterilized. I'm not giving a blood. So albumin comes from blood, right? Because we are donating blood. It comes from blood. It's a blood product. However, it is sterilized in a way. So there really isn't any risk of infection almost like whatsoever. The problem is, is that you don't give... Um, uh, the ability to clot because all you're doing is albumin. But like I said, your other coagulation factors will regenerate no problem, but usually in about 24 hours or so. And so you're going to clot okay. So that's why people can tolerate this pretty well. Yeah. How much math is involved? Anything or is it, it pretty standard? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not doing calculus. Let's put it that way, <laughs> uh, at least in this field. But um, there is some math you're going to need to have to do. Basically, calculating basic blood volumes based on... Uh, so it actually is simple math in the sense that your plasma and your red cells, whatever part of you isn't red cells is essentially going to be plasma. If you measure a known, you find an unknown. That's the basics you're, of the math that you'll need. You are. I really <laughs> am solving for X. I'm sorry, guys. I am. <laughs> All right, let's get to case two. What do we got? All right, so case two. We got a 48-year-old woman now with multiple myeloma. Um, she actually presented to an outside facility uh, with an acute pulmonary embolism, so a big clot in the, in the lungs. 
She was started appropriately on a medication called heparin. It's an anticoagulant. So patient gets transferred over to our facility and happens to have a hemoglobin of 4.9, pretty low. So then we do something called pre-transfusion testing, which is one of the fundamentals of blood banking. So uh, I'm going to go into that. Go up, please. Yeah. I was just going to, for, for the student watching this, so the heparin GTT, that abbreviation just meant Ah, my apologies. Guttai, G-U-T-T-A-E, Latin. It's a drip. So the patient is basically getting a constant stream of heparin to help kind of break down that clot. <laughs> Thank you. My apologies. Yes. All right. So uh, this comes from a book. It is a very dry book. It, some will call it boring. Some like me will call it pretty much uh, an elixir of knowledge to help me get through my day. Um, <laughs> I'm going. What I'm showing you right now is a biochemical structure of the red blood cell. Uh, so now we're going to switch our focus basically to red blood cells. Um, in the uh, highlighted squares uh, are uh, antigens. Um, actually, these are antigen systems. Um, and uh, a lot of these antigens basically are bound to the red cell membrane. We think of antigens A, B, O, right? So like your blood type A, blood type B, blood type O, there are about 200 or so other ones that we have to deal with in blood banking. <laughs> so, um, this is just a sample of some of the clinically significant runs we run into all the time. Um, these, these are the ones when, when someone is looking at getting a, a bone marrow uh, um, uh, transplant, any other sort of organ transplant. These are, you're looking at all these other ones that, uh, for, for compatibility, correct? Believe it or not, when it comes to a bone marrow transplant, it's not that we don't care about ABO system. It's just that it's not nearly as important to us as the HLA system or the human mm -hmm. leukocyte antigen system. Um, but yes, it's a similar concept. We have stuff that is these antigens that play a big role in our immunology, and we got to watch out for them very, very carefully. Yeah. All right. So... Pre-transfusion testing, I want to break it down into this. It's a complicated laboratory workup, which is all that I'm focused on. We use a bunch of different methods to, uh, we use a bunch of different methods, different reagents, and at the end of the day, what we are trying to do is figure out what antibodies are present in plasma, what antigens are present in red cells. I have to draw this out because this is just going to make blood banking for you guys. If there's only one thing you want to learn about blood banking, this is it. And it's going to be <laughs> the simplest thing you can ever remember. I promise. All right. If you understand this very basic concept, you guys are going to be gold. There's it's also a little complicated, whiteboard but... built into this if you wanted to try it. But you got your whiteboard there. Really? So nerd uh, I got a nerd out. It's easier. All right. Yeah. I'm drawing a straight line, guys. Here, red cell. All right. Yeah. This red cell. Right here, happy little red cell. That dot is an antigen. It looks like a uh, COVID spike to me. <laughs> no, 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 no. We're going to call this a happy. We're going to call this a happy red cell. All right. Now this. Antibody. If you remember this, and that your red cells have antigens, your plasma has antibodies, if you remember that concept, that is the basics, very, 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 very fundamental basics of blood banking. What we are trying to do is basically identify antibodies so that when I'm transfusing a red cell into somebody, that red cell is not going to be incompatible with the patient's antibodies, patient's plasma, basically. In other words, these two do not want to get along, actually, in real life. They want to stay separate. If they happen to get along and they come together, it's going to cause a huge immune uh, reaction that could potentially they cause harm to the patient. That's what we're trying to avoid. So our job, figure out what this is. So 
And if we continue on to the next slide, I'll kind of help explain what's going on here. All right. I think it's the next slide. Um, actually, I need to finish that one slide that we were on. Um, Right, so basically it's a lab workup and this is where all the pathology comes in. To identify these antibodies, we've got um, different methods that we're gonna be using. We use different reagents to help bring out these antibodies, so to speak. Um, and at the end of the day, like I said, we wanna make sure we get a good ABO RH type on the patient and we wanna make sure the blood is compatible. Specifically, the red cells do not at all react with uh, the patient. That's the end of the day. So if we go to the next slide, this is what we did. And I'm going to simplify it by saying um, each of the cells, when they're numbered one through whatever, one, two, three, each of these is a red cell. Each row is a red cell. Each column is basically an antigen. So each of those columns, the plus means the antigen is present on the cell. The, um, uh, the zero means that it's absent. Uh, if it's a slash, then it's just maybe not even tested because it's just so rare. But the point is this, at the very last column on the right, you're going to be seeing reaction results. And so all it is is basically, do we see a reaction or do we not? Is an antigen antibody reaction happening in vitro? We're doing all this testing outside the human body because there's no way we're going to be wanting to mess with the patient at all at this time. We're just taking a sample of the patient's blood to practice with just to make sure that if there is no reaction outside the blood, there shouldn't be anything inside the blood, right? So this is all that this testing is doing. And all of this is just a bunch of like, um, a bunch of different methods we were using to try to identify any clinically significant allo antibodies. At the end of the day, what we did was find that there are basically no significant allo antibodies. We've essentially thought we'd ruled everything out. The patient's hemoglobin was 4.9. So we wanted to transfuse three units of blood. So when we did specific testing, we found that those three red cell units, believe it or not, seemed to be okay, okay? So let's transfuse, right? We made sure that the blood is compatible, it is, fine. So let's go to the next slide. So we gave two of those units of red cells and lo and behold, the patient's hemoglobin went up to 7.4. Fantastic, we fixed them, right? Well, it happened to drop the next day back down to 6.7. That was our first clue, something was up. So then we wanted to give the third unit of red cells. Actually, by about that time, we wanted to do an additional uh, pre-transfusion testing um, because there's like a short uh, expiration date. And what happened was we found an allo antibody. In other words, we found that this antibody is after a particular antigen and that antigen is E, big E. Yeah, the capitals matter in this case. So we found an allo antibody. Like, oh, that's not really great. I mean, Waldo. it happens. We found Waldo. Um, and Waldo does appear not infrequently. About like eight out of every hundred patients will develop a Waldo, an allo antibody, after a transfusion. It happens because that's just what biology does. Like you get exposed to something foreign, you're going to make an antibody to it because you've never seen it before. And you're like, you're foreign. I attack you. No, no longer, right? All right, so side story, uh, well, related to the patient's history. Remember, this patient had a multiple myeloma. This patient actually had a huge protein level. This patient's protein level was nearly 6,000 milligrams per deciliter. So we're going to go uh, uh, deja vu on you here, and we're going to do uh, an apheresis treatment, right? So we do an apheresis treatment, and there's a little bit of an issue. Next slide. Coca-Cola, yummy. <laughs> that is not normal, my friends. In fact, remember that straw-colored yellow plasma that is supposed to be in human blood, right? When we took it and collect this patient's plasma, um, that's what we got. And that we should have gotten straw-colored plasma for somebody with a lot of protein. Protein is kind of colorless, really, in this <laughs> setting. So we got a lot of Coca-Cola colored plasma, which tipped us off as saying, that is not consistent with underlying biology here. Um, what's going on? <laughs> so um, if you go to the next slide, I kind of 
dumb it down and kind of make it straightforward. Turns out that some of the red cells we gave this patient was actually positive for the E antigen that he developed an aloe antibody to. In other words, we kind of gave an acute hemolytic transfusion reaction. Yeah, the same kind of acute hemolytic transfusion reaction called an ABO, you know, the same ABO kind of stuff. Uh, we kind of did that. And <laughs> it wasn't intentional, of course. But it wouldn't be a case support if we uh, didn't have any interesting teaching points and issues that we wanted to come across in reviewing this particular case. So a few things from this. One, patient had a really high protein count, like I said. And unfortunately, all this protein is going to muck up with our testing sometimes. So you can get some of these weird rea testing reactions, right? Well, that antibody that we found, what is it? It's a protein. What is the protein that's a myeloma? A protein. So when we're dealing with a lot of protein and a lot, a lot, a lot of protein, you see sometimes that it can be pretty difficult to kind of uh, identify and we'll find Waldo. Exactly. I love your analogy of Waldo. Oh my gosh, I might have to steal this from you and quote you for it. <laughs> no, no, you can have it for free. <laughs> so um, that's one thing that happened. Another thing is, is that... Um, we realized that actually the, when a senior pathologist and a senior technologist had reviewed those panels, we call those panels, those like all those screens, um, we realized that, you know, if we looked carefully enough, we probably could have been able to call an antibody to E in the first place initially. And what we could have done was maybe prevented the transfusion of those E positive cells in the first place. Um, and that would have not, and so that would have prevented the whole thing. But I think at the bottom line is, um, Testing is hard. Lab medicine is hard and it's possible and it happens where ideally you take one method, test something and identify it with this particular method, but do it in a different method and we may miss something. Same concept as I referred to earlier, by the way, when we're trying to do specific testing for HIV, HPV, and trying to find patients appropriately in that window, not in the window period, but like when we actually catch them with the antigen or develop the antibody. See, this is all that pathology is about, and it can be very difficult, and it's knowing what truly is possible versus what is really impossible to a little, like, minimal possibility, you know? And so that's the difficulty that we all run into as laboratorians. Fortunately, yeah. patient did okay, no problems, and uh, in fact, we probably removed a lot of the uh, aloe antibodies by doing this procedure, so maybe at the end of the day, we helped the patient a little bit, but certainly didn't want to see all that uh, Coca-Cola colored plasma. That was quite an interesting case, actually. Wow, very interesting. Um, I'm going to stop the cases here because we're running over a little bit of time. Oh, I got one more. Okay. <laughs> I do want to, I do want to ask, I mean, we can email these email out the cases if, if, uh, it'll be interesting. Um, you know, just... these cases are all published. They're actually, so I was looking for cases. I'm like, well, I'll just use cases that I had actually published. So all these cases are published and are available in journals and uh i'd be happy to send them to you um and you're welcome to distribute them all but these are cases yeah. that we just published so yeah i'll send them out i i want to ask I, I saw a couple students ask is um uh in terms of blood products blood transfusions how close are we to getting to uh e either non-human transfusions where we're using animal blood or synthetic blood how close are we to getting to the, that uh, world you know i actually asked um uh an organization to kind of help bring people who are experts in this field because i have not seen or heard from these experts in a while um i honestly do not know i do know that recently we had made more progress in converting a lot of the a and b um and B blood types to closer to O, but it's still a really long work in progress. But this is the beauty of biology where we take uh, bacteria, other enzymes that we find in wherever we can find them, snip off those A and B sugars so that they become O and more universal. Yeah, It's a slow progress. I haven't heard anything right. much new. All right, fair enough. And, and then one question that's uh, kind of in the news with COVID is there were very early reports, uh, and, and I don't think anything new since, uh, that blood type was potentially a risk factor 
um, mm. with a very small percentage increase risk. Uh, what, as a blood bank specialist, medicine specialist, what, what were your thoughts when you saw that? Until I really know what the function of the ABO system is, which I think we don't have definitive ideas what yeah. exactly, like literally, like what is ABO really, really doing there what other than cause transfusion? <laughs> yes. Um, until we really truly like studied it to the point that we know what exactly the role of the virus is to get into and affect the ABO system protein or is it a genetic mRNA? I don't know exactly. Until yeah. I get to know exactly what that is, I may feel better about knowing what it is, um, its role in the ABO system. Um, yeah. We know, for example, that patients with von Willebrand disease, there is some relationship between von Willebrand disease and O blood types. Uh, yeah. Patients who are O blood type, like me, um, have a little bit lower levels of von Willebrand disease or correction, a little bit lower levels of von Willebrand factor. Sorry, it's the factor von Willebrand that uh, is associated with a whole bunch of stuff in the body. So um, we know that's an association that's real, that's true, and we just keep it an association. So we just figure out later on what happens. So All right. With uh, something like COVID and APR. Well, very cool. I, I think we excited a lot of students. It seemed like they loved these cases. Uh, so hopefully we have a, a new cohort of blood bank medicine specialists in the future. So Dr. Schmuckler, thank you so much for taking some time tonight uh, to come on and share your wisdom and your specialty with everyone. This was awesome. Thank you so much. And if you guys need anything, I'm always happy to re just reach out to me i'm always happy to be there for you guys and support you however i can awesome. you guys are awesome thank you everyone for coming have a good night